Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The 12th and final track on Nirvana's third and final studio record, In Utero, All Apologies is one of Nirvana's most famous songs. Though it was recorded for In Utero in February of 93, Kurt actually wrote All Apologies a few years earlier at some point in 1990. As a matter of fact, the In Utero version of All Apologies isn't the first known studio recording of the song. The first time Nirvana recorded All Apologies was on New Year's Day 1991 in Seattle. The session was produced by Craig Montgomery, who at various other points worked with Nirvana as a recording engineer. Seven songs were recorded that day. Aneurysm, Even in His Youth, Oh the Guilt, On a Plane, Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, Token Easter Song, and All Apologies. Now, what is the song about exactly? Kurt Cobain once told his official biographer Michael Azarad that the song is for his wife Courtney and his daughter Frances Bean. Quote, I like to think the song is for them, but the words don't really fit in relation to us. The feeling does, but not the lyrics. End quote. Again, Kurt wrote the song in 1990. This is before he was with Courtney Love, so it's interesting that he would say the song is about them. Perhaps it means that for Kurt, the meanings of his songs can evolve over time, especially the lyrics. For example, in terms of the lyrics to the song, one of the lines which has stood out to people over the years is when Kurt simply says, married, buried. It's no secret that Kurt and Courtney had a very up and down relationship which has led some people to believe that Kurt singing Married Buried is him expressing how he felt about his marriage with Courtney. With that said, however, keep in mind that on one of In Utero's other tracks, Francis Farmer will have her revenge on Seattle, Kurt is essentially sticking up for Courtney. If you'd like to see the video I made on Francis Farmer, the link is available in the description box below. Going back to all apologies, some have interpreted the song as another example of Kurt expressing his conflicted feelings towards fame, apologizing for being inadequate to be dubbed the quote, voice of a generation. Kurt's daughter, Frances Bean, once said the following about her father, quote, My dad was exceptionally ambitious, but he had a lot thrown on him, exceeding his ambition. He wanted his band to be successful, but he didn't want to be the voice of a generation, end quote. As mentioned, All Apologies appears as the 12th and final track on In Utero. It was released as a split single with Rape Me on December 6, 93. In Utero was produced by Steve Albini. The following is a quote from Steve where he shares his thoughts on the song. Quote, I remember really liking the sound of that song as a contrast to the more aggressive ones. I remember thinking it sounded really good in that it sounded lighter, but it didn't sound conventional. It was sort of a crude, light sound that suited the band. End quote. For his part, Ernie Bailey, one of Nirvana's guitar techs, once said the following about All Apologies. Quote, There were some things that initially appeared as jams between songs and eventually evolved into songs. But in terms of stuff that was completely worked out for In Utero, All Apologies was one of the first to emerge that you know was going to be on the next release. The other stuff, things like Scentless Apprentice, were so different from anything on Bleach or Nevermind that you weren't really sure if this was somewhere they were going or if this was something that was going to get shuffled aside later on. End quote. Now, of course, when it comes to the history of In Utero, there was some controversy involving the mixes. The In Utero mixes were not polished per se like Nevermind mixes were. They were, in comparison, a lot more raw. Though the band wanted this, they ultimately felt like some of the songs should be polished up, which they eventually were. Regardless, Nirvana's record label DGC, who were already unhappy Steve Albini was producing the record to begin with for various reasons, subsequently went after Steve. According to Steve, the label essentially tried to damage his career, which they succeeded in doing so to an extent. During one of the interviews with Steve Albini that I did, he spoke about the situation in detail. If you want to see that interview, the link is available in the description box below. I'll also include a clip from that interview at the end of this video. The following is a quote from Kurt Cobain where he himself reflects on all apologies and the mixing situation. This quote is from Kurt St. Thomas's book, Nirvana, The Chosen Rejects. Quote, The mixing we'd done with Steve Albini was so fast it was ridiculous, about one hour per track. We decided to remix two songs, one of them being All Apologies with Scott Litt. The rest we were able to improve during mastering. They took care of it. We thought mastering was the last stage in the process where you just take the tapes in and run them through a machine that allows you to cut it onto a record. So we went to the mastering plant and learned that you can actually take the vocals right out if you want to. It's amazing. It's practically like remixing. So that's what we did. We just gave the bass more high end so you could hear the notes, turned the vocals up, and that did it. Cured everything. As soon as we'd done it, we knew we'd made the right decision. And now I wouldn't change anything on it. I'm 100% satisfied. End quote. 
The following is from one of my interviews with Steve Albini, where he discusses the craziness of the mixing situation for In Utero. The band called me and said, yeah, the record label and the management hate the record. They want, they want us to redo it all. And I was like, yeah, I kind of saw that one coming. I mean, I think the trajectory of that record, that is them going off to make the record on their own, the record label stamping their feet about it and trying to get them to change it, them ultimately making some changes, the record coming out in a in a way that um, was less than satisfying for me, given that the, their record label and their management tried to scapegoat me like pretty aggressively prior to the release. Like all of that, that whole trajectory, I think that was kind of preordained. I don't think there's any way they could have gotten out of that record without something like that happening. Whoever the, their engineer was, something on that spectrum was going to happen. Some some combination of those those events was going to happen. Given that it did, I feel like they navigated it about as well as anybody could. Hmm. For my part, I might have been... I'm, 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 I was more of a prick then. I, I was more like willing to irritate people. And so I think I was probably, I was probably a little coarser about uh, my reaction to it, to all of those things than was necessary. And I, I'd like to think that I wouldn't behave that way now. It was a very dark time for me. The year after I did that record, I almost went, I went completely broke the year after making that record. Um, there was an there was an aggressive campaign on the part of Geffen Records um, to to discredit me or embarrass me or try to cause me harm, which was effective in that I lost a lot of business in the in the intervening year or so. But. I don't personalize that toward the band. I feel like the band were the, the one party in all of this who were not taking shots at me, you know? Yeah. They were very circumspect when they were talking about the process of making the record in interviews and stuff. Like, they, they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. And so they didn't personalize their complaints um, very much. I'm gratified by the fact that they didn't scapegoat me to the extent, you know, that their record label and their management did. Uh, it's it was a surreal experience to have this big corporation have invested a lot of money and their sort of publicity capital in a record by the biggest band in the world and have those very self same people shit talking me to music journalists and other people in the music business and actively trying to cause me harm. That was a very surreal experience for them to be shitting on this record that was obviously very important to them. From a business standpoint, it was going to be a huge record. And I just didn't get why they were shitting on the record. And then as a secondary effect, shitting on me. I just didn't get it, and it was a, it was an unpleasant period for me. The year after making that record, I saw a big drop off in my normal clientele, like the smaller bands that I was working with, the independent bands. A, a lot of them were suspicious of me now because I had been working, I'd worked on this big hit record, and that that made them suspicious of me and my motives, like. Mm -hmm. There was a kind of a normal career trajectory where somebody would start out in the underground and they would start to get noticed and then they would become sort of a mainstream player and then unavailable to anybody who wasn't a like a, a big name. Yeah. Something similar to that had happened with Butch Vig, like who who was a hero in the underground in the punk scene. Then his name was associated with Nirvana and suddenly you nobody that he had none of the bands that were his bread and butter in the years prior None of them could get, in, get him to answer a phone call. And that's just a result of him moving into a sort of a professional tier where those bands didn't have access, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a suspicion of me that that was, gonna, that, that, that was sort of expected to happen with me, that I would now be unavailable to all of my normal 
clientele. So that normal clientele disappeared or dropped off dramatically. And then the sort of mainstream or major label artists were being actively discouraged from working with me. And I know this because I have friends who were in the process of making records in the year or two after that, yeah. who were told explicitly by their handlers that they were not allowed to work with me. They could work with basically anybody else. They just weren't allowed to work with me. 